Good evening and uh, welcome to this week's edition of Behind the Headlines and in this programme tonight we shall be marking the six month anniversary since the most horrific, most violent mass terrorist attack by Hamas was committed against Israel. Since then we've seen that on October the 27th 2023 we saw uh, the Israeli ground incursion uh, into Gaza to, to destroy Hamas and Israel has been the main focal point for not only world opinion and uh, media coverage but also international opinion and we've seen really that Israel's main allies in the West namely the United States and also Britain are turning their back on Israel and we're seeing that Israel's coming in increasingly uh, pressure both politically and also diplomatically and we'll be asking what does the next six months hold or is Israel facing the prospect of war against Hezbollah in the north and what about the Iranian nuclear program and uh, we all also is seeing that Israel is increasingly being isolated internationally uh, in the world. Um, Reagan, um, it's back to Israel again. And, uh, you know, we've marked a big milestone, really, six months since the most horrific uh, mass terrorism committed by Hamas on October the 7th. Uh, the largest number of Jewish people killed, or I'd say murdered since the, uh, since the Holocaust over 80 years ago in the Second World War. And, and yet we see the world turning against Israel. We see increasingly uh, diplomatic pressure as well as political pressure being placed on Israel to have a ceasefire with no mention of the returning hostages and no security guarantees for Israel um, post uh, the destruction of Hamas in Gaza. Uh, and it's almost like the world is turning against Israel with uh, the unprecedented rise in Jew hatred around the world. Uh, that, um, that the Jewish communities, not only in this country, but also in the States as well and across Europe, are now very fearful because of the rise of Islamism. Well, it is truly a frightening situation for so many of the Jewish community around the world. In one way, you would like to ask the question, who would have thought it possible uh, that individuals who uh, have been victimized in such a heinous way whose homeland has come under such a heinous terror attack would be placed in a position where they are looked upon as the bad guys. Uh, 1,200 plus were slaughtered on October the 7th, six months ago. Uh, there were uh, over 200 abducted and taken into um, a situation of being hostages. Many remain hostages. If indeed the question is being asked, how many are actually still alive? Uh, we've only this week come across the recovery of uh, the body of one of the hostages who apparently died back in January. So there is still so much that is needing to be done to procure those hostages back and there's no end in sight. Negotiations have come and gone and even though Israel has been willing to have the conversation and has been very clear, return the hostages, then we'll talk, Hamas has routinely declined, routinely said no. But as you've already alluded to, we have a problem wherein the other nations have consistently applied pressure and it's creating a, a situation uh, that is uh, really, really detrimental to Israel as a nation state. But also the West as well. And this is what the West has come to a realization. Yeah. Um, by not defending Israel, the West is now in danger as well. So let's have a recap of a, an, a summary of the events uh, prior to October the 7th, but also after October the 7th, as uh, we mark the six month anniversary of the worst mass terrorist attack in Israel's history. Not seen anything like this since the Second World War. So um, prior to the horrific events of October the 7th, uh, Israel was uh, very much a divided country uh, and its society was tearing itself apart over the judicial reforms. We had um, high ranking Israeli uh, military personnel, including those members of the Israeli Air Force who refused to serve under the uh, Benjamin Netanyahu government over judicial reforms. We saw in the aftermath of October the 7th, it uh, united Israel like never before, that Israel is resolved to bring the hostages home as well as uh, defeating Hamas in Gaza. Um, so around 1,200 Israelis were murdered and uh, thousands of uh, Hamas terrorists on October the 7th 
breached Israel's um, security fence, uh, the Rafah crossing next to the Gaza Strip, and attacked innocent civilians. And this was the largest uh, massacre of the Jewish people since the Holocaust uh, over 80 years ago. We see that 6,000 Israelis and foreigners were injured in that day, and many of them in a critical situation, and 250 were kidnapped and taken to Gaza. And according to Newsweek, an IDF spokesman told Newsweek on Friday that there were uh, 134 hostages, among them 11 foreign nationals still being held, with 123 released, and also the news that broke over the weekend that sadly one of those hostages uh, was tortured and murdered by Palestinian Islamic Jihad and his body was located in a cemetery. We see that uh, the IDF put out a joint statement saying the body of the abductee Elad um, Kazir, uh, who according to intelligence was murdered in captivity by Islamic uh, Jihad terrorists organization, was rescued after night from Khan Yunus and returned to Israeli territory. Uh, there's no doubt that the Iranian regime actually gave the green light for this mass terrorist attack as a way of um, exploiting of, uh, events and also distracting from Iran's nuclear weapons program. Uh, on October the 27th, a couple of weeks after the fact, a few weeks after the fact, the IDF finally launched their ground invasion into Gaza, uh, known as Operation Swords of Iron. Since that time, they've been conducting a military operation seeking to destroy Hamas and its terror infrastructure, including the 300 plus terror tunnels in Gaza. Now we are seeing Israel's closest ally, the US and also Britain, increasingly turning on Israel, both politically and diplomatically, as the Jewish state is finding itself increasingly isolated across the world. Since October the 7th, we have witnessed an unprecedented rise in Jew hatred, especially in Britain, that coincides with an upsurge of Islamic extremism and terrorism threatening British democracy and liberty. Uh, I, I think it's important that we remind ourselves six months on of some of what actually occurred, Simon, on October the 7th and reflect on some of the horrors that occurred at that time. According to the Daily Telegraph, under the editorial headline of Remembering October the 7th, the terrorism of October 7th is not past. For all those afflicted, it will continue until Hamas is held to account. Six months since the tr atrocities of October the 7th, the news cycle has inevitably moved on to focus the latest horror and pity of the Israel-Hamas war. But the Telegraph says today, we should pause to remember the victims of that awful day, the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. Nearly 700 Israeli civilians were murdered, including 36 children, alongside 373 military personnel and 71 foreigners. Many died in horrific and degrading ways, subjected to rape, torture, and dismemberment. Here for those who cast accusations against Israel of genocide is a reminder of what a real genocidal frenzy looks like. Uh, there has been criticism after an image of one victim was among a set of photographs recently awarded a journalism prize. The photograph shows Shani Luke sprawled half naked in the back of a truck full of armed men. Her mother says that, quote, seeing those pictures again because of the contest makes our family relive the pain. For the 130 hostages still being held captive, the nightmare continues. Individuals like Alex Danzig, age 75, a historian of the Holocaust, Bepin Joshi, 23, a Nepalese agriculture student, Agam Berger and Daniela Gaboa, both just 19 years old. And we must remember their desperate families, longing for news and terrified of hearing the worst. Nor can we forget the countless uh, Jewish individuals in Britain and around the globe who have found themselves living in fear and facing discrimination and hatred in the wake of the attack. Anti-Semitism is a light sleeper. Dame Maureen Lipman says in an interview today in the Sunday Telegraph, all of us must face this down, uh, reawaken monster wherever we find it. So a very good response, I think, mm. by the uh, Sunday Telegraph, some um, editorial that marked the six month anniversary of October the 7th mass terrorist attack um, by Hamas. And 
It seems like the world is a different place. It almost is very similar to the aftermath of what happened after 9-11, when the uh, Twin Towers were destroyed, the, uh, the Pentagon was attacked and America was under attack. This time, Israel's under attack. And uh, really, the unimaginable happened, that Israel's security at Eretz Crossing, that is that very sophisticated border crossing between Gaza and Israel, um, was, was broken. Um, and uh, of course then Israel was caught up uh, with the prospect of facing between three and 5,000 Hamas terrorists on the rampage that day, um, taking um, over two, 22 to 23 different locations in southern Israel and just carrying out carnage. And, and one of the uh, instances or terror instances that took place was absolutely horrific was the attack on the Nova Music Festival uh, attended by the young Israeli party goers. And now it appears that if it wasn't for the Nova Music Festival, then there would have been nothing to stop Hamas from reaching Ashdod and Ashkelon, Israel's um, towns that are very close to southern Israel. So let's have a look at this excellent uh, report by our friends at CBN uh, marking the attack on the Nova Music Festival. Videos from that day at the Nova Music Festival show hundreds of young people running for their lives, many seen being taken hostage, while others died at the hands of terrorists. Here on the grounds of the Nova Music Festival, they have pictures of all those who were murdered or kidnapped. On October 7th, Hamas murdered 375 that day. That alone would have made it the second largest terror attack in history. Now this place has become a shrine of sorts where soldiers and civilians come to remember and reflect. It's tough, it's a tough feeling. Um, I'm also a member of the tribe, the trance, the music the festivals. I have a lot of friends that were here. I lost a relative who's, I just saw his picture. You're walking here and you feel all the atrocities. The site lies just a few miles from Gaza, where the sound of Israeli artillery fills the air. I feel horrible. I feel deep sorrow and uh, distress when I see all those faces of young, innocent people, so beautiful, so young, that came here to, you know, to have a party of peace and love and were murdered brutally. A new exhibition opened in Tel Aviv to recreate the festival grounds attacked on October 7th and honor its victims. Some of the bodies were so badly burned during the attacks that there's little left to identify. For this soldier, it's a reminder of why he's fighting just miles away. As you can hear, it's still a war zone here. But uh, this place was a, it was a massacre. It wasn't a military encampment, nothing of the sort. It was just a massacre. People were slaughtered here. And a lot of other things that I can't really say on camera, but it's horrible. Where we just went out for a little bit of uh, to get to get some air, we came here to remind ourselves why what we're doing. Yep, that's why we're here. Hundreds of burnt cars littered the road next to the festival that day. This IDF officer fought just down the road while his son fled the music festival. He ran away from the party with uh, two other girls of his, and they actually ran from here towards uh, Kibbutz Patish or Mushab Patish. It was a journey of about two and a half hours. They kept phoning each other. I told him, I can't help you. Because I was on the main road about four or five kilometers down. I, was, I had a fight with some terrorists and I was stuck and he was stuck. And he wanted help and I couldn't help him. And I told him, there's no police, there's no army. Figure it out by yourself, you're a big boy, he's 24 year old. He did figure it out and the three survived, although there's still much sadness. And he lost a lot of friends here. A lot of girlfriends and, boy and uh, boyfriends here he lost at the party. And he's been going to all the funerals and the memorials. His father came with a message. Don't forget. Don't forget anything, because we tend to forget. Everyone has a, small, a short memory, and after a month or two months or a year, you come back here, you'll see there'll be red puppies here, and you'll forget. Don't forget, that's all. Like you, we were, we're not allowed to forget the Holocaust, 
We're not allowed to forget what happened here. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, from the site of the Nova Music Festival. A very stirring reminder of what happened and of the long-lasting impact this massacre has had on Israeli civilians and its common populace across the board. Now, Israel's president has, uh, throughout this whole uh, season, been, I think, a, a massive beacon of light for the nation. Uh, we, we've seen President Isaac Herzog uh, routinely really raising the bar, I think, for um, national leaders in regard to how to deal with victims of such immense atrocities. And uh, the Times of Israel has reported on comments that have been made by Isaac Herzog uh, to mark the six-month anniversary of the horrific events. Uh, there's the headline commemorating six months since October the 7th. Herzog says Israel is obligated to free the hostages. Israel is obligated to do everything creatively, persistently, with determination in its power to secure the release of the hostages still held in Gaza. Tomorrow at 6.29 a.m., he said, uh, this is over the weekend, we will mark six months since the brutal terrorist attack and the terrible massacre. Half a year since the crime against our sisters and brothers, against our country, against humanity. He continues calling the war against Hamas heavy in days and heavy in blood. And for half a year I have seen Israeli society in all its glory. Half a year and every day I feel a new immense pride to be part of this nation. It's hard to know what challenges we still face. But despite the long and difficult road, I look at you, citizens of Israel, and know we will be restored and healed and rebuilt. And we will put up mezuzahs and we will plant and we will reap with joy what we have sown with tears, and we will prove to the whole world the people of Israel live. And that's just, this is exactly what this battle is about, is about the Jewish people living. Um, and also, obviously, the spiritual battle as well that's heavily involved in this one. We know that uh, Hamas represent um, a, a satanic ideology that want to destroy the Jewish people as, as well as the Islamic Republic of Iran and uh, sadly with this as well this unprecedented hatred being poured out upon Israel and the Jewish people around the world and this is what makes this conflict different I think from other previous um, terrorist attacks in Israel or previous wars is this global rise of Jew hatred uh, that is targeting the Jewish people that makes this different. And um, just want to comment on um, Isaac Herzog uh, being very statement like he's reassuring the nation um, in his speech and his address to the nation. Um, and yeah, he's doing he's doing a very good job as, as president. And I think it's important that uh, Israel has a president like him. Uh, for such a time as this. And we also see a response from our own um, Prime Minister, Arishi Sunak, to mark the six month anniversary of October the 7th. So this is a statement put out on the uh, Prime Minister's um, um, own website, um, uh, number 10 Downing Street. It says the PM statement um, marking six months since October the 7th. And this is what he says. Words from the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on the six-month anniversary of October the 7th Hamas terrorist attack against Israel. Prime Minister's office and the Right Honourable Rishi Sunak MP published on the 6th of April. Today marks six months since the terrorist outrage of October the 7th, the most appalling attack in Israel's history. The worst loss of Jewish life since the Second World War. Six months later, Israeli uh, wounds are still unhealed. Families still mourn and hostages are still held by Hamas. After six months of war in Gaza, the toll on civilians uh, continues to grow. Hunger, desperation, loss of life on an awful scale. And we continue to stand by Israel's right to defeat the threat from Hamas terrorists and defend their security. But the whole of the UK is shocked by the bloodshed and appalled by the killing of brave British heroes who were bringing food to those in need. He goes on to say, The terrible conflict must end. The hostages must be released. The aid which we have been straining every Sinu to deliver by land, air and sea must be flooded in. The children of Gaza need a humanitarian pause immediately, leading to a long-term sustainable ceasefire. 
That is the fastest way to get hostages out and aid in, and to stop the fighting and loss of life. Uh, for the good of both Israelis and Palestinians, who all deserve to live in peace, dignity and security, that is what we will keep working to achieve. It's interesting. Uh, what, what do you make of Prime Minister Sunak? Oh, I, I thought it was very warm. Yep. I thought it was very sympathetic. Um, I think he shows that he's a genuine friend of Israel. Uh, unlike uh, Lord Cameron, mm. um, who has been criticising Israel uh, continually in the media, um, threatening British-Israeli relations, saying we'll cut off uh, military aid, even though that aid to, uh, to Israel only represents 0.02% 0, 0 of all Israel's um, import of uh, military uh, assistance. Uh, talking about how he's calling for an immediate ceasefire, in Gaza uh, and a pause in the fighting without any reference to the, the plight of the hostages or the fact that what we saw on October the 7th uh, represented an existential threat to Israel's very existence and survival as the Jewish state. And uh, he's, also written, he's also written, I think, in the Sunday Times, mm. um, an article outlining British foreign policy to Israel and uh, to uh, Gaza in the midst of this conflict. Well, it's interesting in that article that you reference in the Sunday Times, rather than beginning with a recognition that Israel has been, he ends with this, they have been prepared to make a deal with Hamas for a pause in fighting. Um, he, he indicates that there have been occasions that they've sat around the negotiation table. He, he's concluding with this and says, but so far Hamas has said no. We all want an end to the fighting, but we must face up to the difficult question, what should we do if Hamas refuses a deal and if the conflict continues? Well, if he had just started with that and kept it at that, that would have been a semi-appropriate way while reflecting on why this war continues. The, the reality is Hamas has continued to say no, and so the conflict has continued because Hamas has continued to say no to the, the basic humane demand, let the hostages go. Uh, what he chooses to do and what he chooses to root his entire article in is this idea that um, there are humanitarian laws and he says Israel must abide by them, which of course we agree with. But the insinuation he makes throughout the article is that Israel is doing less than they could be doing to abide by humanitarian laws, which is simply not the case. They have a lower ratio of civilian to um, combatant death out of any country in any other conflict. So, you know, we could be looking in the mirror and be looking and, and saying, well, okay, we generally have in recent conflicts averaged about nine. That's kind of the, the average nine civilians to one combatant death. Israel's ratio is two civilians to every one combatant. Significantly better and uh, it ignores the complexity of the urban warfare in Gaza, the fact that civilians are being used as human shields, that Hamas has based its entire operations at times in hospitals, schools, uh, worked alongside UNRWA and uh, along individuals who present themselves as innocent civilians in some cases. So uh, Sunak's language I think is far more appropriate. I, I do think, Simon, that and there's a degree of political game playing, to, uh, even with Sunak's statement to some degree. He says the hostages must be released. The aid which we've been straining, every sign to deliver, he says it must be flooded in, which it has, it has been, Israel has continually been making sure the aid is getting in. He then says there needs to be humanitarian pause immediately and this is the fastest way to get the hostages out. So the burden of responsibility is still on Israel, but really it's not. No, uh, but also I think we have to see how this is playing out domestically yeah. and uh, have a look at the impact of how, yeah, uh, tragically we've seen um, an, a 500% increase in instances of recorded instances of Jew hatred in this country. At the same time, we've seen a kind of explosion in Islamic extremism. Mm. You only have to look at the streets of, of uh, London's capital every Saturday to see the hate marches against Israel, the, the chants of, uh, of, of genocide um, and just real hatred of Israel 
with these marches to demonstrate that, you know, it, uh, that if we don't protect Israel, we don't protect the Jewish community, then our own country is under severe threat from Islamic extremism. Uh, and that's an important indicator because the government is then feeling that pressure. Yes, we need to stand by our one and true ally and democracy in the Middle East that is Israel. At the same time, we need to address this humanitarian crisis caused not by Israel, but by Hamas um, in the aftermath of October the 7th. So therefore, we need to give as much aid and show that we are helping the residents of Gaza um, as a means of pacifying the Islamists. But that's never going to pacify them because of their ideology. And so therefore, as the only true democracy in the Middle East, um, it's vital that our nation, Britain, has, or including the United States, allows Israel to finish the job and to destroy Hamas because that is the only future for the people of Gaza and that's the only future that Israel will be able to tolerate. Uh, and the prospect now that if Israel is put under so much pressure that Israel has to withdraw um, Israel's armed forces from Gaza, uh, this creates massive problems going ahead that uh, Israel could face the prospect of another October the 7th uh, terrorist attack if this is done. Now, uh, Hamas surely knew that Israel would respond with force and with severe force at that after their atrocities on October the 7th. What's their strategy in all of this, Simon? Well, it's a very interesting article written by uh, Matthew Said, writing in the uh, Sunday Times on Sunday. He says, like uh, Ali with Foreman, Hamas has uh, rope duped Israel. The country can only emerge weaker, weakened after falling for the same trick that lured the West into Iraq. And this is what he says. He writes that after 9-11 attacks, America and British leaders uh, thought the full scale invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq would make us safer. Uh, they were terribly wrong, predictably wrong. We struck hard, we fired weapons and killed hundreds of civilians and made ourselves more exhausted and more exposed while squandering our moral authority just as Al Qaeda had intended. Israel, let me suggest, has fallen into the same trap. It says that Hamas is a death cult of fanatics with a cynical overlords, which is perfectly true. But these psychopaths are also capable of sophisticated, if uh, heinous strategy. The raping, torturing and other me medieval barbarities on October 7th didn't spring from a spur of the moment fit of, but they were part of a precision engineered plan to goad their opponents into an overreaction that would make Hamas stronger and Israel weaker. Yeah, I think Hamas knew exactly what they were doing on October the 7th. Uh, the fact is that they were given the green light, obviously by, their, um, by the Qataris and also the Iranians in, um, in Tehran, is an also an indication that they wanted a massive Israel response. Because let, let's face it, as soon as Israel responds um, in a kind of military way, as they have done um, on the 27th of October, we see that uh, the more the news reports the devastation and destruction caused um, by Israel in trying to destroy Hamas, uh, this rallies the Palestinian cause around the world. It, it further advances the Islamist agenda. Mm -hmm. And this also increases the money and the wealth of Hamas leaders living out with their billions of, of money in, in Qatar, uh, in Doha. So they get rich out of this. Uh, and they put this as the major one international focus point. And of course, it's going to cost billions and billions to rebuild Gaza after this war. And of course, they will then hopefully, uh, was what they're hoping for, is to take all that money and never give it to the actual people themselves that, that actually need it in Gaza, to rebuild Gaza, to rebuild the, the area of Gaza that will be free of Hamas. Uh, Syed goes on to make his, his comment. It's in interesting and it's to some degree um, not 100 percent certain where fully he's, he's coming from and uh, what side he, or angle he's wanting to con conclude with but he says that Hamas leaders rejoice in the death of every man woman and child they praise Allah for every charred corpse they cry Allahu Akbar every time a pregnant woman is incinerated or a victim left without limbs they welcome starvation and pestilence they do so partly because they believe martyrdom brings glory to Allah and earthly suffering is part of his divine plan. But they do so also because of the propaganda images of bloodshed beamed to a watching world. 
goes on um, and indicates that they observe Israeli generals and spokesmen seeking to justify the massacre of thousands of children, that's how he puts it, but clarifies that put in harm's way by Hamas, and they smile. Bring it on, they say. Is that all you got? Come on, they go, as Israel becomes more isolated in the UN, its allies consider embargoes and global opinion tilts even more ominously against it. Keep going, please. I think, I think the point that he's actually trying to make here is the fact he's comparing the kind of war on terror with Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza. So he's comparing the West's, Britain and America's response after 9-11 to um, to destroying Al Qaeda in Afghanistan to take out the uh, the Mujahideen, which was the precursor of Al Qaeda, and also to remove the Taliban from power so that um, Afghanistan would never be a safe haven to launch terror attacks in the future, but also the removal of Saddam Hussein, who posed uh, a threat to, to the West. And he's saying that you can't do this by force. This is an ideology. But, but the one thing I think he, he makes the mistake here is realizing that, for example, Gaza is right next to Israel's border. Mm. You know, uh, yeah. Britain and the United States have that luxury that Afghanistan and Iraq are thousands of miles away. Um, and so therefore don't represent an immediate national security threat to the very foundations of Britain or the United States. Um, so therefore he, he's making this comparison, but he's not looking into the equation that it's the Iranians that are ahead of the snake. And until you cut the head of the snake off, um, terrorism and is Islamist terrorism is going to continue. They're the masterminds behind this. They, they want to conduct war against Israel, war against the West, but not on Iran's territory, but transferring that to other states, such as the uh, kind of almost failed state in Yemen with the Houthis. Uh, using the civil war in um, Syria to deploy anything between 80 and 90,000 troops, including the Revolutionary Guards and militias under their control, uh, their support for Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, um, their support for Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza, as well as financing Hamas, uh, to effectively create an Islamic a Shiite crescent that will dominate Tehran all the way over to Jerusalem. And of course, they celebrate Al-Quds Day, which is the destruction of uh, Jerusalem being controlled by the uh, Islamic Shia regime. So this is something he hasn't taken into account. And of course, Israel's fighting a war for survival and it's all about deterrent capabilities that Israel's borders on October the 7th were shattered. That illusion that, that Israel had, that Israel's borders were safe, um, is being blown apart now. The complete trust in the government, the complete trust in the IDF has been broken. No doubt God is using this spiritually to get Israel and the Israeli people to realize who they are, realize their calling as Jewish people and a call back to God as their ultimate uh, protector and savior. Uh, instead of relying on the IDF and uh, having the IDF as, as an idol, I love the IDF and I love the soldiers who serve that, but Israel's protection comes from the God of Israel not the IDF. Um, and I think that's that realization that the strategic dynamics of the Middle East has completely changed. Let's also remember as well that the Iranian regime was on its last legs come 2020. Hezbollah were running out of money. Um, Hamas was, was very weakened. The Palestinian Authority was isolated. Biden comes in, reverses all of Trump's Middle Eastern foreign policies, and of course unleashed the genie from the bottle, which is Islamist terrorism. Uh, and it also started with that disastrous withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan. And really we're paying the consequence mm. now. Well, let's discuss a little bit of the IDF war against Hamas in Gaza since October the 27th. Uh, the Sunday Times reports that half of Hamas's fighting force has been destroyed, according to Israel estimates. Uh, Hamas health run authorities have reported up to now that 33,137 residents of Gaza have been killed by Israeli forces. Uh, but the IDF claims that 12,000 of those are Hamas terrorists, including most of the commanders of Hamas's 24 battalions. It's so important to understand, Simon, that the figures that Hamas releases do not differentiate at all between civilians and those engaged in um, uh, an official way, as 
terrorists alongside Hamas, there's no differentiation between civilians and militants at all. And also, and also how, many, how many of those in Gaza have actually been killed by Hamas themselves? And all exactly, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. We, we know that when Israel either. gave out the warning um, to actually tell the, the residents of Gaza City to evacuate south, we know that Hamas deliberately put roadblocks yes. in the way. And they guns. deliberately shot and killed anyone trying to yeah. attempt to cross that border. And those deaths are added to that yes. tally. This is the total number of deaths that have occurred during that time um, due to the conflict, purportedly. But again, the question also has to be asked, why are we suddenly trusting a terror-run health organization? How can we fully trust its own facts. The figure has been bandied around, it's been regurgitated routinely by the UN and other mainstream uh, press uh, sources that 70% of those slain, uh, of this 33,137 uh, residents of Gaza, are actually uh, women and children. That's how it's presented. 70% are women and children, individuals rage. Uh, but it's actually been shown that it's statistically impossible and inconsistent for that figure um, to have been given if, when, upon further analysis of the, um, the actual breakdown from the hospitals and from uh, the mortuaries and, and various other reports. So the Ministry of Health, the Hamas-run uh, Ministry of Health in Gaza, uh, is giving itself away routinely, showing clearly in its own stats uh, that there are inconsistencies and that there's dishonesty. Now, uh, the big objective here it cannot be lost sight of, and sometimes people are losing, I do believe many have lost sight of the fact that there are still a significant number of hostages who are being held in Gaza. At the start of the war, the main objective Israel had was to rescue 250 hostages that had been taken by Hamas. According to Anshel Pfeiffer uh, writing in the Sunday Times, this turned out to be an impossible task. According to an IDF veteran, the problem is that we are trying to carry out three very different tasks simultaneously. Destroying Hamas, locating and eliminating its leaders and rescuing the hostages are all missions that call for different tactics and types of units. You can't do all three at once, especially when the enemy has so many tunnels to hide in. Exactly, and that's the problem, isn't it? If, if it wasn't for the hostages, this would be so would much be easier for Israel to actually destroy Hamas, to destroy Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Instead, they've had to uh, send their own IDF soldiers into these horrendous uh, dark terror tunnels and face arm-to-arm uh, -arm combat with uh, Hamas terrorists in those tunnels in order to try and find out and locate where the hostages are at the same time destroying uh, Hamas's infrastructure. So let's remind ourselves, and this seems to be the forgotten narrative of October the 7th, and that's what happened to the hostages and also those communities that Reagan and I uh, have actually visited, uh, Kibbutz near Oz, that were completely devastated and destroyed by Hamas on October the 7th, as well as the families of grieving loved ones who've been kidnapped and taken back to Gaza uh, by Hamas. So let's have a look at this one residence of Kibbutz near, uh, near uh, so Kibbutz Narim that is very close to Kibbutz near Oz that was devastated on October the 7th. What went through your heart in that moment uh, in your mind as you were reading that, that the, an invasion was So happening. you can actually go back on my set Facebook group and watch, because I did a live as I was walking around, locking the doors and the windows saying, I don't really think this is necessary because we have the, the fence and the IDF are in the, are, you know, the soldiers are out there and, but I'll humor them. I didn't really take it very seriously, but I did. I locked everything, went back into my safe room, the problem is safe rooms are built to keep you safe from rockets. They don't lock. They're not built for infiltration. So we were in the safe room waiting and hoping that this is going to finish soon. And then we start getting more messages on our internal messaging system, hearing, seeing people writing that, that they're hearing gunfire 
which is not something you would typically hear in the kibbutz. I know what rockets exploding sound like and mortars, but gunfire isn't something that we've heard in the kibbutz, and, and, and people are saying we can hear Arabic through the walls. Now, we're a small community. We're 450 people. I know where everybody lives, and I'm following the progression of these terrorists as more and more people are writing. We hear them outside. We hear them shouting and shooting. And then it started, we hear them infiltrating our house, and, and they're shouting and breaking things, and, and they're trying to enter the safe room. And the only way you can keep that safe room locked to any extent was if you pulled down the handle, because that had that there are iron prongs that go into the frame that work to keep it locked to some extent so that it's built so that if elsewhere in the house is impacted by a rocket, it won't implode and, and blow the door open. So people were standing there holding the handle down. In my safe room, I was with my son who was visiting, luckily. Uh, and he was holding down the handle. In another safe room, a family with a 10-day-old baby, Kai, heard the terrorists entering their house and they, they're saying they're setting our house on fire. And the terrorists had tried to open their door. They didn't manage to, to open the handle, but they bashed it hard enough so that it would get un attached, disattached from the frame to a certain extent. So when they set the house on fire, smoke was streaming into the, their safe room with this 10 day old baby. And they're on the phone trying to get help from, from the army, from the fire department, from the police. Nobody's, and they're telling them, we can't get to you. Nobody's coming. So they were on the phone with somebody from, from Magen David Adom who are down here today from, from the Red, Red Shield and they were directing them what to do with Kai to, to open the window a little bit, put him on the window ledge so that he'd get some fresh air and then put him down low because smoke rises. At the same time, unbeknownst to me, because this was not being written about in the internal messaging system, my son-in-law was in his house with my three young grandchildren, aged two, six, and eight. He's one of the first responders, but he couldn't go out with the other first responders because he was on his own with the children. And he heard the terrorists entering his house and he told the children, hide under the blanket, don't come out, no matter what happens, you're gonna hear a loud noise, but don't come out from under the blanket, it'll be okay, I'm here. He saw the handle starting to move, kicked the door open and shot the terrorist that was just outside his safe room door. He killed that terrorist. He saw two other terrorists ex escaping. He started to go after them, but then he realized that there were numerous terrorists that were highly armed outside of his house. He cut his losses, went back to protect my grandchildren. A truly powerful and moving first-hand account of the horrors of that day and of the immense acts of bravery and courage uh, that were so shown by so many, Simon. Well, I, I chose that video in particular because um, I remember meeting that uh, remarkable uh, New York, uh, New York uh, Jewish woman who, um, who is part of the uh, kibbutz uh, Narim. Um, kibbutz in the south of Israel and uh, she addressed the uh, Christian broadcasters as part of the Christian media summit organized by the Israeli Prime Minister's office when we visited in uh, December of uh, 2022 and um, what struck me with what she said when she addressed us was that she said 90% of this time living here is paradise mm. um, uh, apart from when the uh, rockets and missiles go over then it's like hell but I think we saw on October the 7th, literally the gates of hell unleashed against those Jewish communities in the south of Israel, those kibbutzes. And, and you and I seeing the devastation, destruction caused by Hamas for ourselves also just makes it even more personal um, that we convey the truth of what actually happened there, that this was a program, this was a massacre. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we should never forget the horrors of what happened on October the 7th. And also, I think as, if Israel is able to destroy Hamas and its infrastructure, the big question is what's next? Yeah, this is the question that many are asking, what's going to happen after these military objectives are achieved. The outcome of the war is not going to be determined by the IDF, um, but essentially we can see on, on a political level by the politicians deciding on who in the aftermath will take over Gaza and the task of rebuilding. Uh, the World Bank estimates that the rebuilding of Gaza is going to cost around $18.9 billion and Israel, except for the religious far right, does not want to reoccupy Gaza permanently. Biden administration and the Arab regimes are demanding the return of the PA to rule Gaza and they are prepared to help with military assistance and financial aid. Uh, Netanyahu fears that if this happens it will lead to a two-state solution or a Palestinian state. Uh, Abbas has previously said that, and it will be interesting to see if he keeps to that, they don't want to be riding into Gaza on the back of Israeli tanks. That's how it was put. And I don't think the Israelis want Fatah controlling no. Gaza anyway. Um, if anything else, uh, want a cooperative uh, government, maybe sponsored by the United Arab Emirates or one of Israel's allies in the Gulf to actually help to administer uh, Gaza in the aftermath of destruction of Hamas, um, which is a very important one. But, but also, you can't look at Israel and you can't look at October the 7th without actually looking at uh, what, um, who are the main instigators behind it, who are the puppet masters, and of course, namely uh, the Iranian regime. And um, the Iranian regime had the most to gain from Hamas's mass terrorist attack on Israel on October the 7th, because we know that the regime is coming very close to completing its nuclear weapons program. And, uh, you know, as soon as Israeli uh, troops are distracted uh, from confronting the threat from Hamas in the south and the threat in the north, this means that the Iranian regime can quietly go on about its business and push for nuclear breakout and acquire nuclear weapons. So let's have a look at uh, this report from our friends at CBN saying how that uh, the Iranian regime has been using October the 7th attack as a smokescreen in order to advance their nuclear weapons ambitions. As Israel fights Hamas in the south and prepares for a potentially greater conflict with Hezbollah in the north, Iran remains a major player behind the chaos. That could be due to the regime trying to distract the world from what's happening with the country's nuclear program. Whether it is a formal strategy or it's just happening that way, it's absolutely a danger. Iran threw out the nuclear inspectors, eight most important ones, in September 2023. They tripled the speed of enriching uranium for most of the last few months, between 60 percent and 20 percent enriched uranium. Experts believe the regime has enough uranium to make up to eight nuclear weapons. They could enrich to 90 percent weaponized uranium in like a week or two. Israel, the United States, the world is very distracted by Hamas, Hezbollah and the rest of the world by Ukraine. So could Iran try to break out now? Yeah. Iran claims it successfully launched three satellites earlier this year. Bob sees this as especially significant in terms of weapons delivery systems. The technology they use for launching satellites can also be used potentially for nuclear weapons, in particular um, ICBMs, which can go a lot further. As far as we know, they're not there yet, but we have to keep a very strong eye on that too. Rafael Grossi, chief of the International Atomic Energy Agency, recently reported that Iran continues to prevent access to inspectors and video recorded by cameras at key nuclear sites. We must move forward in the clarification of the many aspects that require this from Iran. All countries that have signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty are not supposed to have nuclear weapons in any form. This is forbidden in international law. Bob says Iran is effectively blinding the world to the country's nuclear progress. It's a very dangerous situation and it's problematic. The, the, the IAEA Board of Governors, you know, has basically decided to do nothing about it, certainly not referring it to the UN Security Council. Bob maintains sanctions from the original 2015 nuclear deal could be reintroduced through a snapback arrangement 
but this provision has a time limit. If the United States and the three key European countries want to snap back, they can snap it back and the entire UN Security Council would need to enforce it. When you get to October 2025, January 2026, so many of the limits on Iran fall apart that Israel and I hope the United States will need to make a decision to do something potentially militarily with Iran if it does not radically reduce where its nuclear program is today. Retired General Amir Avivi, head of the Israel Defense Security Forum, sees Iran's nuclear threat in a global context. If Israel has to go to an all full-scale war with uh, Lebanon, this is our chance also to hit Iran and all the nuclear sites. So really, if the U.S. wants to avoid a regional and maybe global war, it needs to show leadership and uh, really, really deter Iran and Hezbollah. This is the only way to stabilize the Middle East. Avivi also uses more of a moral perspective to describe Israel's war with Iran's proxies. It's a war between darkness and light, between evil and good. We're fighting the whole Western society's war against extremism, against people who really want to destroy our way of living. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Always grateful to our friends at CBN for their helpful news reporting during this season. I think they've uh, done a stellar, stellar job. Uh, the reality is, Simon, that so many people just don't care about this at all, uh, and that they don't understand or uh, even have the knowledge that Iran is backing what Hamas is doing and that they're involved heavily with PIJ, the uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Uh, there seems to be this compartmentalization where everything is, it's just very much about what's happening in Gaza. People aren't always looking at the bigger picture. Uh, yeah, we, we can say that about the Biden administration. We can say that about completely. our own, um, own government as well. Um, seems like our government has completely taken its eyes off the Iranian nuclear threat. And of course, this is the biggest threat uh, in terms of our national security um, that we face. Uh, Iran with nuclear weapons being the largest state sponsor of international terrorism is a frightening prospect because essentially it means that the regime can use nuclear weapons as a means to carry out terrorist attacks without ever having to pay a price or face reprisals. That's the danger, as well as starting a proliferation of nuclear weapons across the Middle East. The Saudis are on it, the Gulf states are on it, the Egyptians want it. And before you know it, you have the world's most dangerous region of the world being armed with nuclear weapons and missiles that threatens the very destruction of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, to have nuclear weapons in the hands of this Islamic uh, dictatorship in Iran is far more dangerous than what Israel is dealing with in, uh, in Gaza right now with, with Hamas, and that's the number one priority. So you take, you cut the head of the snake off, you uh, bring about regime change in Iran and we'll see international terrorism drop like that. And that's why it's imperative, I think, to uh, as ever much we focused on wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Gaza, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, the eye of the target should be Tehran and the regime, not the Iranian people, but the horrific uh, regime of the mullahs. Yeah, and uh, we'll be seeing more of what happens in coming days, I think in regard to that as it's very much developing. Uh, it has had a massive impact on Britain's Jews as well. October the 7th uh, has seen many experience anti-Semitic Jewish hate crimes. The JNS is UK Jewry under threat in a way not seen since the Middle Ages. The British establishment does not want to recognize the severity of the problem created by the Muslim minority, according to journalist David Collier. Ever since Hamas committed crimes against humanity on October the 7th, the democratic foundations of the United Kingdom have been shaken. And at the same time, and there is a direct connection, the Jewish community has been under threat in a way not seen here since the Middle Ages. And he talks about the growing threat to British democracy itself, the hatred that has been experienced and recounts some of those 
elements, uh, personal attacks on individuals and people who are identifiable in some way, uh, either by Mug and David or various uh, symbols that may be on, he even mentioned someone, um, having a, a sports bottle, a water bottle with a, a symbol of an Israeli sports club. Uh, people being attacked on the train, being shouted at, free Palestine, uh, all, all sorts that you can see. Um, it's just absolutely horrifying with a 500% jump in the number of anti-Semitic attacks yeah. in the UK since the start of the government. Well, I know we're coming to the end of the programme, but I think there are two very significant prophetic signs that have occurred since October the 7th. Firstly, uh, we, we will see over the next coming years, after October the 7th, uh, and a massive increase in Jewish people making Aliyah to Israel, namely from Europe and also really from the first time from the United States. But also we're seeing the, the international isolation of Israel as forecast um, in the book of Revelation and the Bible as well, that Israel will be isolated internationally because the nations of the world will come against Israel uh, and the Lord will bring them into the valley of Jehoshaphat because they divided his people and scattered his land. And that's the danger because it's not Israel that hangs in the balance, it's the nations of the world that hang in their balance and how they treat Israel and the Jewish people. Yeah. Well, thank you, Simon, for a great program and for um, unpacking this with me. It's, I think it's a very important subject to remember. We need to continue praying for the peace of Jerusalem, indeed for an end to this conflict. And in line with scripture, we know what the prophets have said. We continue looking forward to the return of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Jesus. God bless you all, and we'll see you again, God willing.